I arrived for the banquet wearing a suit of clothes tailored just for the occasion. The colors were good for me, leaf green and black. There was too much brocade for my taste, but tonight I made a grudging bow to fashion as I would be seated to the left of Malowan Lackless. Stapes had staged six formal dinners for me in the last three days, and I felt prepared for anything. When I arrived outside the banquet hall, I expected the hardest part of the evening would be feigning interest in the food. But while I might have been prepared for the meal, I was not prepared for the sight of Malo and Lackless herself. Luckily, my stage training took hold, and I moved smoothly through the ritual motion of smiling and offering my arm. She nodded courteously, and we made our procession to the table together. There were tall candelabra with dozens of candles, engraved silver pitchers held hot water for hand bowls and cold water for drinking glasses. Old vases with elaborate floral arrangements sweetened the air. Cornucopia overflowed with polished fruit. Personally, I found it gaudy, but it was traditional, a showcase for the wealth of the host. I walked the Lady Lackless to the table and held out her chair. I had avoided looking in her direction as we walked the length of the room, but as I helped her into her seat, her profile struck me with such a strong resemblance that I couldn't help but stare. I knew her. I was certain of it. But I couldn't for the life of me remember where we might have met. As I took my seat, I tried to guess where I might have seen her before. If the lackless lands weren't a thousand miles away, I would have thought I knew her from the university. But that was ridiculous. The lackless heir wouldn't study so far from home. My eyes wandered over maddeningly familiar features. Might I have met her at the Aeolian? That didn't seem likely. I would have remembered. She was strikingly lovely, with a strong jaw and dark brown eyes. I'm sure if I'd seen her there... Do you see aught that interests you? She asked without turning to look at me. Her tone was pleasant, but accusation lay not far beneath the surface. I had been staring. Hardly a minute at the table, and I was already putting my elbow in the butter. I beg your pardon, but I am a keen observer of faces, and yours struck me. Meloin turned to look at me, her irritation fading a bit. Are you a tourageur? Tourageurs claim to be able to tell your personality or future from your face eyes, and the shape of your head. Pure-blooded, vintage superstition. I dabble a bit, milady. Really? What does my face tell you, then? She looked up and away from me. I made a show of looking over Meloin's features, taking bandage. note of I've her pale skin before. and artfully curled chestnut hair. Her mouth was full and red without the benefit of any paint. The line of her neck was proud and graceful. I nodded. I can see a piece of your future in it, milady. One of her eyebrows went up a bit. Do tell. You will be receiving an apology shortly. Forgive my eyes. They flit like the Calanthus, place to place. I could not keep them from your fair flower face. Meloen smiled, but did not blush. Not immune to flattery, but no stranger to it either. I tucked that bit of information away. That was a fairly easy fortune to tell, she said. Oh, See you size. anything size else? Tournament, like every tournament. I took like another moment to search problem, her face. Bro. Two other things, milady. It tells me you are Melo and Lackless, and that I am at your service. She smiled and gave me her hand to kiss. I took hold of it and bowed my head over it. I didn't actually kiss it, as would have been proper back in the Commonwealth. Instead, I pressed my lips briefly onto my own thumb that held her hand. Actually kissing her hand would have been terribly forward in this part of the world. Our banter was stalled by the arrival of the soups, forty servants placing them before forty guests all at once. I tasted mine. Why in God's name would anyone make a sweet soup? I ate another spoonful and pretended to enjoy it. From the corner of my eye, I watched my neighbor, a tiny older man I knew to be the Viceroy of Bannis. His face and hands were wrinkled and spotted, his hair a disarrayed tousle of gray. 
I watched him put a finger into his soup without a hint of self-consciousness, taste it, then push the bowl aside. He rummaged in his pockets and opened his hand to show me what he'd found. I always bring a pocket full of candied uh, almonds to these things, he said in a conspiratorial whisper, his eyes as cunning as a child's. You never know what they'll try to feed you. He held his hand out. You can have one if you like. I took one, thanked him, and faded from his awareness for the rest of the evening. When I glanced back several minutes later, he was eating unabashedly from his pocket and bickering with his wife about whether or not the peasantry could make bread from acorns. From the sound of it, I guessed it was a small piece of a larger argument that they had been having their entire lives. To Meluin's right, there was a Yilish couple, chatting away in their own lilting language. Combined with strategically placed decorations that made it difficult to see the guests on the other side of the table, Meluin and I were more alone than if we had been walking together in the gardens. The mayor had arranged his seating well. The soup was taken away and replaced with a piece of meat I assumed was pheasant covered in a thick cream sauce. I was surprised to find it quite to my taste. So, how do you think we came to be paired? Meluin asked conversationally. Mr. Quo. I made a small seated bow. It could be because the mayor wished you to be entertained, and I am at times entertaining. Quite. Dude, they're all the way up or it could be I paid the steward an incredible sum of money. Her smile flickered again as she took a drink of water. Enjoys boldness, I thought to myself. I wiped my fingers and almost set the napkin on the table, which would have been a terrible mistake. That was a signal to remove whatever course was currently being served. Done too soon, it implied a silent but scathing criticism of the host's hospitality. I felt a bead of sweat begin to trickle down my back between my shoulder blades as I deliberately folded the napkin and laid it on my lap. Heavy ammo. So, how do you occupy yourself, Mr. Quoth? She hadn't asked as to my employment, which meant she assumed I was a member of the nobility. Luckily, I'd already laid the groundwork for this. I write a bit. Genealogies. A play or two. Do you enjoy the theater? Occasionally. Depending. Not correct, that guy. Depending on the play. Depending on the performers, she said, an odd tension touching her voice. I wouldn't have noticed it if I hadn't been watching her so closely. I decided to change the subject to safer ground. How did you find the roads on your way to Severin? I asked. Everyone loves to complain about the roads. It's as safe a topic as the weather. I heard there has been some difficulty with bandits to the north. I hope to excite the conversation a little. The more she talked, the better I could get to know her. The roads are always thick with rue bandits this time of year, Meluin said coldly. Not just bandits, rue bandits. She said the word with such a weight of cold loathing in her voice that I was chilled to hear it. She hated the rue. Not the simple distaste most people feel for us, but a true, sharp hate with teeth in it. I was saved from making a response by the arrival of chilled fruit pastries. To my left, the viceroy argued acorns to his wife. To my right, Meluin slowly tore a strawberry pastry in half, her face pale as an ivory mask. Watching her flawless, polished nails tear the pastry into pieces, I knew her thoughts were dwelling on the rue. Aside from her brief mention of the Adima Rue, the evening went quite well. I slowly set Meluin at her ease, talking casually of small things. The elaborate dinner lasted two hours, giving us ample time for discussion. I found her to be everything Alvaron had suggested, intelligent, attractive, and well-spoken. Even the knowledge that she loathed the Rue could not entirely keep me from enjoying her company. I returned to my room immediately after dinner and began to write. By the time the mayor came to call, I had three drafts of a letter, an outline of a song, and five sheets filled with notes and phrases I hoped to use later. Come in, your grace. I glanced up as he entered. He hardly seemed the same sickly, doddering man I'd nursed back to health. He'd put on some weight and looked five years younger. What did you think of her? 
Alvaron said. Did she mention any suitors when you spoke? No, your grace, I said, handing him a folded piece of paper. Here is the first letter you will want to send to her. I trust you can find a way of delivering it to her secretly. He unfolded it and began to read, his lips moving silently. I labored out another line of song, scratching out the cording alongside the words. Eventually, the mayor looked up. Don't you think this is a little much? He said uncomfortably. No. I paused in my writing long enough to gesture with my pen toward a different piece of paper. That one is too much. The one in your hand is just enough. She's got a streak of romance in her. She wants to be swept from her feet, though she'd probably deny it. The mayor's expression was still doubtful, so I pushed myself away from the table and set down my quill. Your grace, you were right. She is a woman well worthy of pursuit. In a handful of days, there will be a dozen men in the estates who would gladly take her to wife. Am I right? There are already a dozen here, he said grimly. Soon, there will be three dozen. Add another dozen she will meet at dinner or walking in the garden. Then another dozen who will court her merely for the chase. Of those dozens, how many will write her letters and poems? They will send her flowers, trinkets, tokens of affection. Soon she will be receiving a deluge of attention. You have one best hope. I pointed to the letter. Act quickly. That letter will catch her imagination, her curiosity. In a day or two, when the other notes are cluttering her desk, she will already be awaiting the second one of ours. He seemed to hesitate a moment. Then his shoulders bowed. Are you sure? I shook my head. There are no certainties in this, Your Grace. Only hopes. That is the best one I can give you. Alvaron hesitated. I know nothing of this, he said with a hint of petulance. I wish there were some book of rules a man could follow. For a moment, he looked very much like an ordinary man and very little like the Mayor Alvaron at all. Truthfully, I was more than slightly concerned myself. What I personally knew about courting women could comfortably fit into a thimble without taking it off your finger first. On the other hand, I had a vast wealth of secondary knowledge. Ten thousand romantic songs, plays, and stories taken all together had to be worth something. And on the negative side, I'd seen Simon pursue nearly every woman within three miles of the university with the doomed enthusiasm of a child trying to fly. What's more, I had watched a hundred men dash themselves to pieces against Denna like ships attempting to ignore the tide. Alvaron looked at me his face still showing honest concern. Will a month be enough time, do you think? When I spoke, I was surprised by the confidence in my own voice. Your Grace, if I cannot help you catch her in the space of a month, then it cannot be done. Chapter 68 The Cost of a Loaf The days that followed were pleasant ones. My sunlight hours were spent with Denna in Severin Low, exploring the city and surrounding countryside. We spent time riding, swimming, singing, or simply talking the afternoons away. I flattered her outrageously and without hope, because only a fool would hope to catch her. Then I would return to my rooms and pen the letter that had been building inside me all day. Or I would pour out a torrent of song to her. And in that letter or song, I said all the things I hadn't dared to tell Denna during the day. Things I knew would only frighten her away. I just watched Madness After I finished the letter or the song, I would write it again. I would dull its edges a little, remove an honesty or two. I slowly smoothed and stitched until it fit Malo and Lackless as snugly as a calfskin glove. It was idyllic. I had better luck finding Denna in Severin than I ever had in Imre. We met for hours at a stretch, sometimes more than once a day, sometimes three or four days in a row. Though, in the interest of honesty, things were not perfect. There were a few burrs in the blanket, as my father used to say. The first was a young gentleman named Jared, who accompanied Denna on one of our early meetings down in Severin Low. He didn't know her as Denna, of course. He called her Elora, and so did I for the rest of the day. 
What is this tournament? Garrett's face held the doomed expression I had come to know very well. Oh. He had known Denna oh. long enough to fall for her, and he was yeah. just beginning to realize his time was drawing to an end. I watched as he made the same mistakes I'd seen others make before him. He put his arm around her possessively. He gave her the gift of a ring. As we strolled the city, if her eye focused on anything for more than three seconds, he offered to buy it for her. He tried to pin her down with a promise of some future meeting. A dance at the de Fair's manse. Dinner at the Golden Board. The Tenpenny King was being performed tomorrow by Count Abelard's men. Individually, any of these things would have been fine, perhaps even charming. But taken together, they showed themselves as pure, white-knuckled desperation. He clutched at Denna as if he were a drowning man and she a plank of wood. He glared at me when she wasn't watching, and when Denna bid the two of us goodbye that evening, his face was drawn and white as if he were already two days dead. The second burr was worse. After I'd been helping the mayor court his lady for almost two so span, bad. Denna disappeared. No trace so or word boring. of warning. No lie. note of farewell or apology. I I'm waited for three hours pretty, at the livery uh, where we'd agreed to meet. After that, I went to her inn, only to find that she had left with all her things the night before. I went to the park where we had taken lunch the previous day, then to a dozen other places where we'd made a habit of each other's company. It was near midnight by the time I took the lifts back to the top of the shear. Even then, some foolish part of me hoped she would greet me at the top, rushing into my arms again with her wild enthusiasm. But she wasn't there. That night, I wrote no letter or song for Maloin. The second day, I ghosted through Severin Lowe for hours, worried and wounded. Later that night in my rooms, I sweat and cursed and crumpled my way through twenty sheets of paper before I arrived at three brief, half-tolerable paragraphs which I gave to the mayor to do with as he wished. The third day, my heart sat like a stone in my chest. I tried to finish the song I'd been writing for the mayor, but nothing worthwhile came of my efforts. For the first hour, the notes I played were leaden and lifeless. The second hour, they grew discordant and faltering. I pressed on until every sound my lute made grated like a knife against teeth. I finally let my poor, tortured lute fall silent, remembering something my father had said long wrong? ago. Is that bad? Songs Ready choose bed, their hour and their own season. For three hours. When your tune's tin, there is a reason. The tone of a tune is your heart's metal, and there's no clear water it's from a muddy water. well. All you can do is let the silt settle, or you'll sound sour as a broken bell. Where are we going, Spikes? I lowered my loot into its case, knowing the truth of it. I needed a few days before I could productively you, return to courting Maloin on the mayor's behalf. Left me and I died the work was too delicate to force or fake. On the other hand, I knew the mayor would not be pleased with a delay. I needed a diversion, and since the mayor was too clever by half, it needed to be at least halfway legitimate. I heard the telltale sigh of air that signaled the mayor's secret passage opening in my dressing room. I made sure I was pacing anxiously by the time he came through the doorway. You mean when I clutched up in Alvaron had continued to put on weight in the last two span, and his face was no longer hollow and drawn. He cut quite a figure in his finery, a creamy ivory shirt and stiff jacket of deep sapphire blue. I got your message, he said brusquely. Have you finished the song, then? I turned to face him. No, your grace. Something more important than the song has come to my attention. No, that's more for you, as far you as you are concerned, there is nothing more important than the song, the mayor said firmly, tugging the cuff of his shirt to straighten it. I've heard from several people that Maloin was greatly pleased with the first two. You should focus the whole of your efforts in that direction. Your Grace, I'm well aware that... Out with it, Alberon said impatiently, glancing at the face of the tall gear clock that stood in the corner of the room. I have appointments to keep. system has got to go. Your life is in further danger from Cardicus. So I'll give this to the mayor. He could have made his living on the stage. The only break in his composure was a brief hesitation as he tugged his other cuff into place. And how is that? He asked, apparently unconcerned. 
There are ways for him to harm you other than poison. Things that can be done from a distance. A spell, you mean? Alberon said. He means to conjure up ascending and set it to be devil me. Talu, anyway. Spells and sendings. Where the fuck did it was easy to forget this it's intelligent, subtle, and otherwise educated man was little better than a child when it came to arcane matters. He probably believed in fairies and the walking dead. Poor fool. However, attempting to re-educate him would be tiresome and counterproductive. There is a chance of that, Your Grace, as well as other more direct threats. He dropped some of his unconcerned poise and looked me in the eye. What could be more direct than ascending? The mayor was not the sort of man to be moved through words alone, so I picked up an apple from a bowl of fruit and polished it on my sleeve before handing it to him. Would you hold this for a moment, Your Grace? He took it suspiciously. What's this about, then? I walked over to where my lovely burgundy cloak hung on the wall and retrieved a needle from one of its many pockets. I'm showing you the sort of thing Cauticus is capable of, Your Grace. I held out my hand for the apple. He gave it back, and I looked it over. Holding it at an angle to the light, I saw what I'd hoped for, smudged onto the glossy skin of the apple. I muttered a binding, focused my alar, and pushed the needle into the center of the blurry imprint his forefinger had made on the apple's skin. Alvaron twitched and made an inarticulate noise of surprise, staring at his hand as if it had been unexpectedly, say, pricked with a pin. I'd half expected him to rebuke me, but he did nothing of the sort. His eyes went wide, his face pale, and his expression grew thoughtful as he watched the bead of blood swell on the pad of his finger. He licked his lips and slowly put his finger into his mouth. I see, he said quietly. Such things can be guarded against? It wasn't really a question. I nodded, keeping my expression grave. Somewhat, Your Grace. I believe I can create a... a charm to protect you. I only regret I didn't think of this sooner, but with one thing and another... Yes, yes, the mayor waved me into silence. And what will you require for such a charm? It was a layered question. On the surface, he was asking what materials I would need. But the mayor was a practical man. He was asking me my price as well. The workshop in Cauticus's tower should have the equipment I need, Your Grace. What materials he doesn't have on hand, I should be able to find in Severin, given time. Then I paused, considering the second portion of his question, thinking of the hundred things the mayor could grant me. Money enough to swim in. A newly crafted loot of the sort only kings could afford. I felt a shock run through me at the thought. An Antressor loot. I'd never even seen one, but my father had. He'd played one once in Annalyn, and sometimes, when he'd had a cup of wine, he would talk about it, his hands making gentle shapes in the air. The mayor could arrange this sort of thing in the blink of an eye. All that and more, of course. Alvaron could arrange access to a hundred private libraries. A formal patronage would be no small thing either coming from him. The mayor's name would open doors as quickly as the king's. There are a few things, I said slowly, that I have been hoping to discuss with your grace. I have a project I need assistance to pursue properly, and I have a friend, a talented musician, who could use a well-placed patron. I trailed off meaningfully. Alvaron nodded, his gray eyes showing he understood. They didn't notice the mayor was no fool. He knew the cost of a loaf. I'll have Stapes get you the keys to Cauticus's tower, he said. How long will this charm take to produce? I paused as if considering. At least four days, Your Grace. That would give me time for the muddy waters of my creative well to clear. Or time for Denna to return from whatever errand had pulled her suddenly away. If I was sure of his equipment, it could be sooner, but... I will have to move carefully. I don't know what Cauticus might have done to foul things before he fled. 
Alvaron frowned at this. Will you be able to continue your current projects as well? No, Your Grace. It will be rather exhausting and time-consuming, especially since I'm assuming you'd prefer I be circumspect while gathering my materials in Severin Low. Yes, of course. He exhaled hard through his nose. Damn and bother! Things were going so well. Who can I bring in to write letters while you're occupied? He said the last musingly, mostly to himself. I needed to nip that thought in the bud. I did not want to share credit for Maloin's courtship with anyone. I don't think that will be necessary, Your Grace. Seven or eight days ago, perhaps, but now, as you say, we have her interest. She's excited, eager for the next contact. If a few days pass with nothing from us, she will be disappointed. But more importantly, she will be anxious for the return of your attention. The mayor smoothed his beard with one hand, his expression pensive. I considered making a comparison to playing a fish on a line, but I doubted the mayor had ever engaged in anything so rustic as fishing. Not to presume, Your Grace, but in your younger days, did you ever attempt to win the affection of a young lady? Alvaron smiled at my careful phrasing. Shit. You may presume. I I couldn't walk up. Which did you find more interesting? The ones who leapt to your arms straight away? Or those who were more difficult, reluctant, even indifferent to your pursuit? The mayor's eyes were far away with remembering. The same is true of women. Some cannot bear it when a man clings to them, and they all appreciate space to make their own choices. It's hard to long for something that is always there. Alvaron nodded. There is some truth in that. Absence feeds affection. He nodded more firmly. Very well. Three days. He glanced at the gear clock again. And now I must be... One final thing, Your Grace, I said quickly. The charm I will make must be tuned specifically to you... It will require some of your cooperation. I cleared my throat. More precisely, some of your... Dude. I cleared my throat. Substance. Speak plainly. I mean, that, that a small amount of me, blood, right? saliva, so skin, hair, and urine. I sighed internally, knowing that to someone of the superstitious Vintic mindset, this would sound like a recipe no, for ascending or some crazy. other equally ridiculous thing. As I'd expected, the mayor's eyes narrowed at the list. While I am no expert, he said slowly, those seem to be the very things I should avoid parting with. How can I trust you? I could have protested my loyalty, pointed out my past service, or brought to his attention that I'd already saved his life. But over the last month, I'd come to know how the mayor's mind worked. I gave him my best knowing smile. You are an intelligent man, Your Grace. I'm sure you know the answer without my telling you. He returned my smile. Humor me, then. I shrugged. You're of no use to me if you're dead, Your Grace. His gray eyes searched mine for a moment, then nodded, satisfied. Very true. Send a message when you need those things. He turned to leave. Three days. Chapter 69. Such Madness. I made several trips to Severin Lowe to gather materials for Alvaron's gram. Raw gold, nickel and iron, coal and etching acids. I acquired the money for these purchases by selling off various pieces of equipment from Codicus's workshop. I could have asked the mayor for money, but I'd rather he thought of me as independently resourceful rather than an ongoing financial drain. Quite by coincidence, in the course of this buying and selling, I visited many of the places Denna and I had spent time together. I'd grown so accustomed to finding her that now I caught glimpses of her when she wasn't there. Every day my hopeful heart rose at the sight of her turning a corner, stepping into a cobbler's, raising her hand to wave from across a courtyard. But it was never truly her, and I returned to the mayor's estate wow, each evening more desolate than the day before. The king of getting pred once. Making things worse was the fact that Braden had left Severin several days ago to visit some nearby relatives. 
I didn't realize how much I'd come to depend on him until he was gone. As I've already said, a gram is not particularly difficult to make if you have the proper equipment, a schema, and an alar like a blade of Ramston steel. The metalworking tools in Caudicus's tower were serviceable, though nowhere near as nice as those in the fishery. The schema was no difficulty either, as I have a good memory for such things. While I was working on the mayor's gram, I started a second one to replace the one I'd lost. Unfortunately, given the relatively crude nature of the equipment I was working with, I didn't have time to finish it properly. I finished the mayor's gram three days after talking to the mayor, six days after Denna's sudden disappearance. The following day, I abandoned my pointless searching and planted myself in one of the open-air cafes where I drank coffee and tried to find inspiration for the song I owed the mayor. Ten hours I spent there, and the only act of creation I accomplished was to magically transform nearly a gallon of coffee into marvelous aromatic piss. That night, I drank oh, okay, an unwise okay. amount of scutton and fell asleep at my writing desk. Meloin's oh, yeah. song was still unfinished. Dude, yeah. The mayor know, was less than pleased. Denna reappeared on the seventh three. day as I wandered Dude, our like, haunts in Severin Low. Despite all like, my searching, she sleep. saw me first and ran laughing to my side, excited to tell me about a song she'd heard the day before. We spent the day together as easily as if she'd never left. I didn't ask her about her unexplained disappearance. I'd known Denna for more than a year now, and I understood a few of the hidden turnings of her heart. I knew she valued her privacy. I knew she had secrets. That night, we were in a small garden that ran along the very edge of the shear. We sat on a wooden bench looking out over the dark city below, a messy splay of lamplight, streetlight, gaslight, with a few rare sharp points of sympathy light scattered throughout. I am sorry, you know, she said softly. We'd been sitting, quietly watching the lights of the city there, for bro. nearly a quarter hour. If she was continuing some previous conversation, I couldn't remember what it was. Beg pardon? When Denna didn't say anything immediately, I turned to look at her. There was no moon, and the night was dark. Her face was dimly illuminated by the thousand lights below. Sometimes I leave, she said at last, quick and quiet in the night. Denna didn't look at me as she spoke, keeping her dark eyes fixed on the city below. It's what I do, she continued, her voice quiet. I leave. No word or warning first. No explanation after. Sometimes it's the only thing that I can do. She turned to meet my eyes then, her face serious in the dim light. I hope you know without my telling you, she said. I hope I don't need to say it. Denna turned back to look at the glimmering lights below. But for what it's worth, I am sorry. We sat for a while then, enjoying a comfortable silence. I wanted to say something. I wanted to say it didn't bother me, but that would be a lie. I wanted to tell her all that really mattered to me was that she came back, but I was worried that might be too much truth. So rather than risk saying the wrong thing... I said nothing. I knew what happened to the men who clung to her too tightly. That was the difference between me and the others. I did not clutch at her, try to own her. I did not slip my arm around her, murmur in her ear, or kiss her unsuspecting cheek. Certainly, I thought of it. I still remembered the warmth of her when she had thrown her arms around me near the horse lift. There were times I would have given my right hand to hold her again. But then... I thought of the faces of the other men when they realized Denna was leaving them. I thought of all the others who had tried to tie her to the ground and failed. So I resisted showing her the songs and poems I had written, knowing that too much truth can ruin a thing. And if that meant she wasn't entirely mine, what of it? I would be the one she could always return to without fear of recrimination or question. So I did not try to win her and contented myself with playing a beautiful game. But there was always a part of me that hoped for more, and so there was a part of me that was always a fool. I should start using the wingman again. Days passed, and Denna and I explored the streets of Severin. We lounged in cafes, attended plays, went riding. So 
We climbed the face of the shear using the low road just to say we'd done it. We visited the dock markets, a traveling menagerie, and several curiosity cabinets. Some days we did nothing but sit and talk, and on those days, nothing filled our conversations as much as music. We spent countless hours discussing the craft of it, how songs fit together, how chorus and verse play against each other, about tone and mode one, and meter. These were things I'd learned at an early age and thought about often. And though Denna was new to this study, in some ways, that worked to her advantage. I'd learned about music since before I could talk. I knew 10,000 rules of melody and verse better than I knew the backs of my own hands. Denna didn't. In some ways, this hampered her, but in other ways, it made her music strange and marvelous. I'm doing a poor job of explaining this. Think of music as being a great snarl of a city like Tarbian. In the years I spent living there, I came to know its streets. Not just the main streets, not just the alleys. I knew shortcuts and rooftops and parts of the sewers. Because of this, I could move through the city like a rabbit in a bramble. I was quick and cunning and clever. Denna, on the other hand, had never been trained. She knew nothing of shortcuts. You'd think she'd be forced to wander the city, lost and helpless, trapped in a twisting maze of mortared stone. But instead, she simply walked through the walls. She didn't know any better. Nobody had ever told her she couldn't. Because of this, she moved through the city like some fairy creature. She walked roads no one else could see, and it made her music wild and strange and free. In the end, it took 23 letters, six songs, and though it shames me to say it, one poem. There was more to it than that, of course. Letters alone cannot win a woman's heart. Alvaron did a fair piece of his own courting, and after he revealed himself as Meluin's anonymous suitor, he did the lion's share of the work, slowly wooing Meluin to his side with the gentle reverence he felt for her. But my letters caught her attention. My songs brought her close enough for Alvaron to work his slow, garrulous charm. Even so, I can take only a small piece of credit for the letters and songs. And as for the poem, there is only one thing in the world that could move me to such madness. Chapter 70. Clinging. I met Denna outside her inn on Chalker's Lane, a little place called The Four Tapers. As I turned the corner and saw her standing in the light cast by a lantern hanging above the front door, I felt an upwelling of joy at the simple pleasure of being able to find her when I went looking. I got your note, I said. Imagine my delight. Denna smiled and made a one-handed curtsy. She was wearing a skirt, not a complicated dress of the sort a noble woman would wear, but a simple sweep of fabric you could wear while bucking hay or going to a barn dance. I wasn't sure you would be able to make it, she said. It being past the hour most civilized folk have taken to their beds. I'll admit I was surprised, I said. If I was the sort of man to pry, I would wonder what kept you occupied until this most unseemly hour. A lot. Business, she said with a dramatic sigh. A meeting with my patron. He's in town again? I asked. She nodded. And he wanted to meet you at midnight? I asked. That's... Odd. Dennis stepped out from under the inn sign, and we began to walk down the street together. The hand that holds the purse, she said, giving a helpless shrug. Odd times and inconvenient places are the rule the with Master Ash. Some part of me suspects he might simply be some lonely noble bored with ordinary patronage. Who the fuck is I wonder Pablo? if it adds some spice for him, pretending he's meshed in some dark intrigue instead of just commissioning some songs from me. So, what do you have planned for tonight? I asked. Only to pass time in your lovely company, Dennis said, reaching out and linking her arm with mine. In that case, I said, I have something to show you. It's a surprise. You'll have to trust me. I've heard each of those a dozen times. Dennis's dark eyes glittered wickedly. But never altogether, and never from you. She smiled. 
I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and save my world-weary jibes for later. Take me where you will. So we made our way to Severin High by way of the horse lifts, where we both gawked at the lights of the nighttime city below like the low-born Cretans we were. I took her on a long stroll through cobblestone streets, past shops and small gardens. Then we left the buildings behind, climbed over a low wooden fence, and moved toward the dark shape of an empty barn. At this, Denna was no longer able to keep quiet. Well, you've done it, she said. You've surprised me. I grinned at her and continued to lead the way into the dark of the barn. It was full of the smell of hay and absent animals. I led her to a ladder that disappeared into the dark above our heads. A hayloft? She demanded, her voice incredulous. She stopped walking and gave me an odd, curious look. You obviously have me mistaken for a 14-year-old farm girl named... Her mouth worked soundlessly for a moment. Something rustic. Greta? I suggested. Yes, she said. You obviously have me mistaken for a low-bodiced farm girl named Greta. Rest assured, I said, if I were going to try to seduce you, this isn't the way I would go about it. Is that so? She said, running her hand through her hair. Her fingers began to idly twine her hair into a braid. Then she stopped and brushed it out. In that case, what are we doing here? You mentioned how much you enjoyed gardens, I said, and Alvaron's gardens are particularly fine. I thought you might enjoy a turn about the place. In the middle of the night, Denna said. A charming moonlit stroll, I corrected. There's no moon tonight, she pointed out. Or if there is, it's barely a slender sliver. Be that as it may, I said, refusing to be daunted. How much moonlight does one actually need to enjoy the smell of gently blooming jasmine? You also need to find In the hayloft, Dennis said, her voice thick with disbelief. Nice. The hayloft is the easiest way onto the roof, I said. Thence into the mayor's estates. Thence to the garden. If you're in the mayor's employ, she said, why not simply ask him to let you in? Ah, I said dramatically, holding up a finger. Therein lies the adventure. There are a hundred men who could simply take you strolling in the mayor's gardens, but there is only one who can sneak you in. I smiled at her. What I'm offering you, Denna, is a singular opportunity. She grinned at me. You know my secret heart so well. I extended my hand as if I were about to assist her into a carriage. My lady. Denna took my hand, then stopped as soon as she put her foot onto the first rung of the ladder. Hold on. You aren't being genteel. You're trying to get a look at my dress. I gave her my best offended look, pressing my hand to my chest. Lady. As a gentleman, I assure you, she swatted at me. You've already told me you're not a gentleman, she said. You're a thief, and you're trying to steal a look. She stepped back and made a parody of my courtly gesture of a moment before. My lord. We made our way through the hayloft, onto the roof, and into the garden. The sharp sliver of moon above us was thin as a whisper, so pale that it did nothing to dim the light of the stars. The gardens were surprisingly quiet for such a warm and lovely night. Ordinarily, even at this late hour, couples would be strolling the paths or murmuring to each other on the bower benches. I wondered if some ball or courtly function had pulled them all away. The mayor's gardens were vast, with curving paths and cunningly placed hedges making them seem larger still. Denna and I walked side by side, listening to the sigh of the wind through the leaves. It was like we were the only people in the world. I don't know if you remember, I said softly, not wanting to intrude upon the silence. A conversation we had some time ago. We talked of flowers. I remember, she said just as softly. You said you thought all men had got their lessons in courting from the same worn book. I was yeah. only planning on sure Denna laughed quietly, minutes, more emotion than a sound. I'm tired. She put her hand to her mouth. Oh, I'd forgotten. I did say that, didn't I? I nodded. 
You said they all brought you roses. They still do, uh, she said. On I wish they would find a new book. Well depends on how much sleep I get. You made honestly. me pick a flower if that I would suit you sleep, better, I said. I well. if I don't, she I don't smiled up well. at me shyly. I remember. I was testing you. Then she frowned. But I you got the better of me by picking one I'd never heard of, let alone seen. The way that people play it. We turned a corner, and the path led down the no, dark I, green like, tunnel like the of an arching part, bower. He's, he's getting sleep. I don't know if you've seen them yet, I said. But here is your Celis flower. There were only stars lighting our way. The moon so slender, it was almost no moon at all. Under the trellis, it was dark as Denna's hair. Our eyes were wide and stretching to the dark, and where the starlight slanted through the leaves, they showed hundreds of Celis blossoms yawning open in the night. If the scent of Celis were not so delicate, it would have been overpowering. Oh, Denna sighed, it, yeah, looking around with know, wide it's, eyes. It's just hard for Under the to bower, like, her skin was well, brighter than the like moon. She reached out her hands to both sides. Like impossible, They're so soft. We walked in silence. All around us, Sella's vines wove themselves around the trellis, clinging to the wood and wire, hiding their faces from the nighttime sky. When eventually we came out the other side, it seemed as bright as daylight. The silence stretched until I started to grow uncomfortable. So now you know your flower, I said. It seemed a shame you'd never seen one. They're rather difficult to cultivate, from what I've heard. Perhaps they do suit me, then, Denna said softly, looking down. I don't take root easily. Why aren't I Rico? We continued I walking until go. the path turned and hid the bower behind us. You treat me better than I, I deserve, do, but like, I'm trying to Denna quit, said at last. Like, I laughed you know, at the ridiculousness of that. Only respect for the I'll silence of the garden kept it from I, rolling I, out of me in a great booming laugh. Instead, I stifled it as much That's as possible, the though no the effort threw me off my stride and made me stumble. Denna watched me from a step away, a smile spreading across her mouth. Like Eventually, like I caught my breath. That, like, matter? You who you sang know? with me the night I won my pipes. You who have given me Days the finest like, gift I ever did I receive. Well, a thought I'm, occurred to me. You know? Did you know, I said, that your loot case saved my life? The smile like spread and grew like, wide as a flower. Know, did it like now? Over it. I'm just drinking caffeine it did, only on I said. Days. I cannot ever hope to treat you as and well as you deserve. Well enough, Given what I owe you, this is but the smallest payment. Well, I think it is a lovely start. She looked up at the sky and drew a long, deep breath. They're only temporary and it Hurts. I've always liked moonless nights best. It's easier to say things in the dark. Though. It's easier to be yourself. <laughs> it's not fun. She began walking again, and I fell into step beside her. We passed a fountain, a pool, a wall of pale jasmine open to the night. We crossed a small stone bridge that led us back among the shelter of the hedges. You could put your arm around me, you know, she said matter-of-factly. We are walking in the gardens alone, in the moonlight such as it is. Denna looked sideways at me, the side of her mouth quirking upward. Such things are permitted, you realize. Her sudden change in manner caught me off my guard. Since we had met in Severin, I had courted her with wild, hopeless pageantry, and she had matched me without missing a beat. Each flattery, each witticism, each piece of playful banter she returned to me, not in an echo but a harmony. Our back and forth had been like a duet. But this was different. Her tone was less playful and more plain. <laughs> it was so Owl. sudden a change that I was at a loss for words. Drama again. Four days ago, I turned my foot on that loose flagstone, she said softly. Remember? We were walking on Mincet Lane, I just want to watch my foot slipped, time, and you caught me almost before I knew that I was stumbling. Four shots it made me wonder how closely three you must be watching me to move. see something like that. Three hours of sleep, I'd literally we turned a corner in the path, and Denna to continued it. to speak without looking up at me. Ooh, is it a nice Her voice was soft and musing, nice almost as if she were talking to herself. You had your hands on me then, sure as anything, steadying me. You almost had your arm around me. It would have been so easy for you then. 
a matter of inches. But when I got my feet beneath me, you took your hands away. No hesitation. It's not, no that's lingering. Not that people, like, will open Nothing I might take amiss. I mean, I don't even know who does it. She started to turn her face to me, then stopped and looked down again. Once, but not during this game, during it's a quite game. a thing, she said. I just wanted to try it. There are so many men, all endlessly attempting to sweep me off my feet. And there is one of you trying just the opposite, making sure my feet are firm beneath me, lest I fall. Almost shyly, she reached out. Dude. When I move to take your arm, you accept it easily. You even lay your hand on mine as if to keep it there. She explained my movement exactly as I was making it, and I fought to keep the gesture from becoming suddenly awkward. But that's all. You never presume. You never push. Is it weird that the hardest part about the Do you know how strange like... that is to me? We looked at each other for a moment, there, in the silent moonlight garden. I could feel the heat of her standing close to me, her hand clinging to my arm. Inexperienced as I was with women, even I could read this cue. I tried to think of what to say, but I could only wonder at her lips. How could they be so red as this? Even the cellars was dark in the faint moonlight. How were her lips so red? Then Denna froze. Not that we were moving much, but in a moment, she went from motionless to still, cocking her head like a deer straining to catch a half-heard sound. Someone's coming, she said. Come on! Clinging to my arm, she pulled me off the path, over a stone bench, and through a low, narrow gap in the hedges. We finally came to rest in the center of some thick bushes. There was a convenient hollow where we both had room to crouch. Thanks to the work of the gardeners, there was no undergrowth to speak of. No dry leaves or twigs to crackle or snap under our hands and knees. In fact, the grass in this sheltered place was thick and soft as any lawn. I don't. There are a thousand girls who would walk with you along the moonlit garden paths, Dennis said breathlessly. But there's only one who will hide in the shrubbery with you. She grinned at me, her voice bubbling with amusement. Denna peered out of the hedge toward the path, and I looked at her. Her hair fell like a curtain down the side of her head, and the tip of her ear was peeking out through it. It was, at that moment, the most lovely thing that I had ever seen. Then, I heard the faint grit of footsteps on the path. The soft sound of voices came sifting through the hedge, a man and a woman. What's up, Mono? After a moment, they came walking around the corner, arm in arm. I recognized them immediately. What do you want, Luis? I turned and leaned close, breathing softly into Denna's ear. Yoda, Mono? That's the mayor, I that. said. And his young lady I love. You seem like a dickhead, but... Denna shivered, and I shrugged out of my burgundy cloak, draping it over her shoulders. <laughs> I peered back out at the two of them. As I watched, Maloin laughed at something he said and rested her hand atop his on her arm. I doubted he'd have much more need of my services if they were already on such familiar terms as that. Not for you, my dear, I heard the mayor say clearly as they passed near us. You shall have nothing but roses. Denna turned to look at me, her eyes wide. She pressed both her hands against her mouth to stifle her laughter. In another moment, they were past us, strolling slowly along, walking in step. Denna removed her hands and took several deep, shuddering breaths. He has a copy of the same worn book, she said, her eyes dancing. I couldn't help but smile. Apparently. So that's the mayor, she said quietly, her dark eyes peering between the leaves. He's shorter than I imagined. Would you like to meet him? I asked. I could introduce you. Oh, that would be lovely, she said with a gentle edge of mockery. She chuckled, but when I didn't join her laughter, she looked up at me and stopped. You're serious? She cocked her head to one side, her expression trapped between amusement and confusion. We probably shouldn't burst out of the hedge at him, I admitted, but we could come out on the other side and loop that around to meet him. So mad. I gestured with my hand at the route we could take. I'm not saying he'll invite us to dinner or anything, but we can make a polite nod as we pass him on the path. Ow. Ow. Denna continued to stare at me, her eyebrows furrowing in the faint beginning of a frown. Dude, there was a full You're there. serious, 
she repeated. Yeah, so what I do you... To get off. I stopped I as I realized what her expression meant. I, I wasn't really planning on playing long. You thought I was lying I'm about working tired. for the mayor, I said. What do you say? You thought I was lying about being able to invite you in here. Men tell stories, she said dismissively. They like to brag a bit. I didn't think any less of you for telling me a bit of a tall tale. I, want to know what I wouldn't said. lie to you, I said, then reconsidered. No, that's not the truth. I would. You're worth lying for. But I wasn't. You're worth telling the truth for, too. Denna gave me a fond smile. That's harder to come by anyway. So, would you like to? <laughs> I asked. Meet him, I mean. Uh, she looked out of the hedge toward the path. No. When she shook her head, her hair moved like drifting I shadows. Exactly what he said. <laughs> I believe you. So There's far, no man. need. That's funny. She looked down. Besides, I've got grass stains on my dress. What would he think? I've got leaves in my I hair, right I admitted. I know exactly what he would think. We stepped What's out from the hedge. On? I picked the leaves out of my hair, and Denna brushed her hands down the front of her skirt, wincing a bit as she moved over the grass stains. We made our way back onto the path and started walking again. I thought of putting my arm around her, but didn't. I was no good judge of these things, but it seemed the moment had passed. Denna looked up as we passed a statue of a woman picking a flower. She sighed. What it was more exciting when I didn't know I had permission, she admitted with a little regret in her voice. It always is, I agreed. Chapter 71, Interlude, The Thrice Locked oh, some Chest. Some of the movement texts in this game are stupid. Quoth raised his hand, motioning Chronicler to stop. The scribe wiped the nib of his pen on a nearby cloth and rolled his shoulders stiffly. Wordlessly, Quoth brought out a worn deck of cards and began to deal them around the table. Bast picked up his cards and looked them over curiously. Chronicler frowned. What? Footsteps sounded on the wooden landing outside, and the door to the Waystone Inn opened, revealing a bald, thick-bodied man wearing an embroidered jacket. Mayor Land, the innkeeper said, putting down his cards and getting to his feet. What can I do for you? A drink? A bite to eat? A glass of wine would be quite welcome, the mayor said as he moved into the room. Do you have any red Grimsby Inn? The innkeeper shook his head. I'm afraid not, he said. The roads, you know, it's hard to keep things in stock. The mayor you nodded. Broken enough to get I'll take anything red then, he said. But I won't it's pay more than a penny for it, mind you. Crazy, so of course not, sir, the innkeeper said solicitously, wringing his more. hands a bit. Anything to eat? No, the bald man said. I'm actually here to make use of the scribe. I thought I'd wait until things quieted oh, down a bit so enough. we could yeah, have some like privacy. He looked around the empty room. I don't imagine you'd mind my borrowing the place for half an hour, would you? Not at all, the innkeeper smiled ingratiatingly. He made a shooing motion to Bast. But I had a full board, Bast protested, waving his cards. The innkeeper frowned at his assistant, then headed back into the kitchen. The mayor removed his jacket and laid it across the back of a chair while Bast gathered up the rest of the cards, grumbling. The innkeeper brought out a glass like, of know, red wine, then locked the front door with a large brass key. You be really careful with how you I'll take the boy upstairs with me, he like said to the mayor, the legend to give like you some privacy. Legend, you can't, like, off the That's like, exceedingly crazy. kind of you, them be the mayor said as he sat across from Chronicler. Problem. I'll give a shout when I'm finished. But you also can't nerf it like the innkeeper nodded useless. and herded Bast out of the common room and up the, the stairs. Whole, like, shit Quoth hard opened to the door to his room and gestured Bast inside. Job. I wonder what I old Lant wants to keep secret, Quoth said, as good, soon though. as the door was closed behind them. I hope he's not too long about it. He's got two children by the widow Creel, Bast said matter-of-factly. Quoth raised an eyebrow at that. Really? Bast shrugged. Everyone in town knows. Quoth humped at this as he settled down into a large upholstered chair. What are we going to do with ourselves for half an hour? He asked. It's been ages since we've had lessons, 
Bast pulled a wooden chair away from the small desk and sat on the edge of it. You could teach me something. Lessons, Quoth mused. You could read Selim Tincher. Reshi, Bast said imploringly. It's so boring. I don't mind lessons, but do they need to be book lessons? Bast's tone wrung a smile from Quoth. A puzzle lesson, then. Bast's face broke into a grin. Very well. Let me think for a second. He tapped his fingers against his lips and let his eyes wander the room. It wasn't long before they were drawn to the foot of the bed where the dark chest lay. He made a casual gesture. How would you open my chest if you had a mind to? Bast's expression grew slightly apprehensive. Your thrice-locked chest, Reshi? Quoth looked at his student, then laughter bubbled up out of him. My what? he asked incredulously. Bast blushed and it's looked not, down. That's, that's just how I think of it, like he mumbled. You know, eh? As names go, you know what I'm saying? Quoth hesitated, a smile playing around his mouth. Well, it's a little storybook, don't you think? You're the one who made the thing, Reshi, Bast said sullenly. Three locks and fancy wood and all that? It's not my fault it sounds storybook. Quoth leaned forward and rested an apologetic hand on Bast's knee. It's a fine name, Bast. Just caught me off my guard is all. He leaned back again. So, how would you attempt to plunder the thrice-locked chest of Quoth the Bloodless? Bast smiled. You sound like a pirate when you say it that way, Reshi. Dude, he gave the chest I'm a speculative uh, look from across the room. I suppose asking you for the keys is out of the question? He asked at last. Correct, Quoth said. For our purposes, assume I have lost the keys. Better yet, well, assume I am dead and you are now free to pry into all my secret things. I love how close That's a little grim, Reshi. Bast reproached gently. Life is a little grim, Bast, Quoth said without any hint of laughter in his voice. You'd best start getting used to it. He waved a hand toward the chest. Go on. I'm curious to see how you go about cracking this little chestnut. Bast gave him a flat look. Puns are worse than book lessons, Reshi, he said, walking over to the chest. He nudged it idly with his foot, then bent and looked at the two separate lock plates, one dark iron, the other bright copper. Bast prodded the rounded lid with a finger, wrinkling his nose. I can't say as I care for this wood, Reshi, and the iron lock is positively unfair. What a useful lesson this has already been, Quoth said dryly. You've deduced a universal truth. Things are usually unfair. There aren't any hinges either, Bast exclaimed, looking at the back of the chest. How can you have a lid without any hinges? That did take me a while to work out, Quoth admitted with a touch of pride. Bast got down on his hands and knees and looked into the copper keyhole. He lifted one hand and pressed it flat against the copper plate. Then he closed his eyes and went very still, as if he were listening. After a moment of this, he leaned forward and breathed against the lock. When nothing happened, his mouth began to move. While his words were spoken too softly to hear, they carried an undeniable tone of entreaty. After a long moment of this, Bast sat back on his haunches, frowning. Then he grinned playfully, reaching out with a hand, and knocked on the lid of the chest. It made barely any noise at all, as if he were wrapping his knuckle okay, against a stone. Out of curiosity, Quoth asked, what would you do if something knocked back? Bast came to his feet, left the room, and returned a moment later with an assortment of tools. He got to one knee and, using a piece of bent wire, fiddled with the copper lock for several long minutes. Eventually, he began to curse under his breath. When he shifted position to get a different angle, his hand brushed the dull iron faceplate of the lock and he jerked back, hissing and spitting. Getting back to his feet, Bast threw down the wire and brought out a long pry bar of bright metal. He tried to work the thin end of it under the lid, but couldn't gain any purchase in the hair-thin seam. 
After a few minutes, he abandoned this as well. Next, Bass tried to tip the chest on its side to examine the bottom, but his team, best bro. efforts only managed to slide it an inch or so across the floor. How much does this weigh, Reshi? Bass exclaimed, looking rather exasperated. Three hundred pounds? Over four hundred when it's empty, Quilt said. Remember the trouble we had getting it up the stairs? Sighing, Bast examined the chest for another long moment, his expression fierce. Then he extracted a hatchet from his bundle of tools. It wasn't the rough, wedge-headed hatchet they used to cut kindling behind the inn. It was slender and menacing, all forged of a single piece of metal. The shape of its blade was vaguely reminiscent of a leaf. He tossed the weapon lightly in his palm, as if testing its weight. This is where I would go next, Reshi, if I were genuinely interested in getting inside. Oh, that's great he gave start. his teacher a curious look. But if you'd rather I not... That's a great start. Quoth made a helpless gesture. Don't look to me, Bast. I'm dead. Do as you will. Bast grinned and brought the hatchet down on the rounded peak of the chest. There was a strange, soft ringing noise, a like a padded right, bell yeah, being struck in a seconds. distant room. Bast paused, then rained a fury of angry blows down on top of the chest, first swinging wildly with one hand, then using both hands in great overhand chopping motions, as if he were splitting wood. The bright, leaf-shaped blade refused to bite into the wood, each blow turning Wait, aside as if cheating. Bast were attempting to chop apart a great, seamless he's block of stone. I don't think he's actually cheating. Eventually, Bast stopped, breathing hard, and bent to look at the top of the chest, running his hand over the surface before turning his attention to the hatchet's blade. There's no way he got that lucky. He sighed. You do good work, Reshi. Quoth smiled and tipped an imaginary hat. What? Bast gave the chest a long look. No, I don't believe that. I'd try to set fire to it, but I know Roa doesn't burn. I'd have better luck getting it hot enough so the copper lock would melt, but to do that, I'd need to get the whole thing to sit face down in a forge fire. He looked at the chest, large as a gentleman's traveling trunk. But it would have to be a bigger forge than the one we have here in town, and Dude, I don't yeah, even know how hot lucky. copper needs to be in yeah, order to melt. Same. Information such as that, Quilt said, really trying to shoot would me. doubtless be the subject of a book uh, lesson. I mean, he was trying to shoot and me. I expect you've taken precautions against that sort of thing. Wow, that's, I that's have, Quilt admitted. But it was a good idea. It shows lateral hey, thinking. Up, guys? An acid? Bast said. I know we have some potent do, stuff downstairs. Do, 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 do. Formic do, is useless do, against do, Roa. Do. Quoth said, do, 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 as is the muratic. Do, do, do. You might have some luck with Aqua Regis, but the wood is quite thick, and we don't have much on hand. I wasn't thinking of the wood, Reshi. I was thinking of the locks again. With enough acid, I could eat clean through them. You're assuming they are copper and iron all the way through, Quoth said. Even if they were, it would take a great deal of acid, and you would have to worry about the acid itself spilling into the yeah. chest, ruining whatever's inside. The same is true with the fire, of course. Bast looked at the chest for another long moment, stroking his lips thoughtfully. That's all I have, Reshi. I need to think on it some more. Quoth nodded. Looking somewhat disheartened, Bast gathered up his tools and carried them away. When he returned... He pushed the chest from the other side, sliding it I back a fraction of an inch until it was square with the foot no, of the I'm bed again. Never mind. It was a good attempt, Bast, Quoth reassured him. I need somebody to Very methodical. I need somebody to you went about it just yeah, as I would have. Hello? The mayor's voice came hollowly up from the room below. I'm finished! Bast hopped up and hurried to the door, pushing his chair back under the desk. The sudden okay, motion though? disturbed one of the crumpled hey, sheets of paper yesterday. resting there, causing it to tumble stuff. to the floor where it bounced and rolled beneath the chair. I saw it way too Bast late. paused, then bent to pick it up. No, Quoth said grimly. Leave it. Bast stopped with his hand outstretched, then stood and left the room. Quoth when followed, the closing like the door weeks, behind them. Still really fucking far, bro. Chapter 72. Horses. You did. You did nice. Several days after Denna and I had our moonlit stroll in the garden, I finished a song for Meloin called Nothing But Roses. 
The mayor specifically requested it, and I had leapt to the project with a will, knowing that Dana would laugh herself sick when I played it for her. I, to, like, I slid the mayor's song into an envelope and looked at the bro. clock. I like, I'd thought I'd be busy the entire night finishing it, but it had come with surprising ease. Consequently, I had the rest of the I evening free. It was late, but not terribly late. Not late for kindling night in a lively city like Severin. Perhaps not too late to find Denna. I threw on a set of fresh clothes and hurried out of the estates. Since the money in my purse came from selling pieces of Cauticus's equipment and playing that. cards with Wait, nobles who I knew jumped. more about fashion than statistics, cratered. I paid the full bit for the horse lifts, then jogged the half mile to Newell Street. I slowed to a walk and for the last impulse, several Joel. blocks. Enthusiasm is flattering, but I didn't want to arrive at Denna's Inn panting and sweating like a lathered horse. I wasn't surprised when I didn't find her at the Four Tapers. Denna wasn't the sort to sit and twiddle her thumbs just because I was busy. But the two of us had spent the better part of a month exploring the city together, and I had a few good guesses as to where I might find her. Five minutes later, I spotted her. She was moving through the crowded street with a definite purpose, walking as if she had somewhere important to be. <laughs> I started to make my way toward her, then hesitated. Where would she be going so purposefully, alone, so late at night? She was going to meet her patron. I wish I could say I agonized before I decided to follow her, but I really didn't. The temptation of finally learning the identity of her patron was simply too strong. So... I put up the hood of my cloak and began to ghost through the crowd behind Denna. It's remarkably easy if you have a little practice. I used to make a game of it in Tarbian, seeing how far I could follow someone without being seen. It helped that Denna wasn't a fool and stayed in the good parts of the city where the streets were busy, and in the dim light my cloak looked a nondescript black. I followed her for half an hour. We passed cart vendors selling chestnuts and greasy meat pies. Guards mingled with the crowd, and the streets were bright with scattered streetlights and lanterns hung outside the doors of inns. An occasional out-at-the-heels musician played with his hat in front of him, and once we passed a troop of mummers acting out a play in a small cobblestone square. No, I didn't get the little foam things. I just got the riser. I don't even know what the foam things do, but... Sounds like too much. I should've picked up some ammo. Did people land here? I'm a little confusion. Is this? I was part of that looted. I. Th Are I supposed to add a little resistance? Mm, I feel like I feel like professional gamers don't need that shit. I feel like that's some that's some that's some amateur that's some amateur shit. It's gotta be right. Like there's no way. What's up, Jay? <laughs> 